If you've ever encountered apologetics before, in particular Christian apologetics, though the following might apply in part to other religions as well, you've most likely heard one of the arguments from the category I like to call the appeals to ultimates. You've probably heard something like this before. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? In the name of progress, modern man has tried to answer those questions without reference to God. If God does not exist, then man and the universe are inevitably doomed to death. Now what does all this imply? It means that life itself is absurd. It means that the life we do have is ultimately without meaning, value, or purpose. Now, the correct response to arguments like this is to recognize them as blatant appeals to emotion and consequences. If there's no God, there's no ultimate meaning, and your life therefore will be totally meaningless. And doesn't it make you feel sad? Therefore you should believe in God. This is basically what they amount to, and of course, this should be enough to dismiss them entirely. Another option, if you wish to approach these arguments not from a purely logical point of view, but actually engage with their appeals to emotion, is to point out how it's not necessary to have ultimate and infinite objective eternal anything. How our own finite meanings we give to our own lives and lives of others, how our temporary goals and values, how our subjective morals are and should be enough. There's no need for absolutes. After all... Only a Sith deals in absolutes. However, in this video I wanted to, for the sake of the argument, ignore this obvious glaring hole in place of where logic should have been, and try to figure out whether it even makes any sense to expect any sort of such ultimates from a Christian god to begin with. So what are these ultimates? Well, as Mr. William Lane Craig explains in this quote-unquote interview for the Avoid project that I have shown the clips from, they are concepts like meaning, purpose, value, etc i.e. subjective concepts people have for themselves or give others, that to actually make them ultimate come from Craig's God. What I will attempt to do here, however, is to point out how, in his own worldview, this attempt to create these ultimates will crash into God's own infinite qualities and the Bible narrative, and crash hard. Well, first of all, let's start with... Ultimate Morality. I wanted to mention that I personally find ultimate morality to be a somewhat distinct subject from the rest of the ultimates, but which apologists lump in with the rest all the time, such as Craig does here. But it gets even more distressing, for if life ends at the grave, it makes no ultimate difference whether you live as Joseph Stalin or as a Mother Teresa. If your destiny is ultimately unrelated to your behavior, then you may as well just live as you please. Moral values are either just expressions of personal taste or else the byproducts of biological evolution and social conditioning. Who's to say whose values are right and whose are wrong? Now think of what that means. It means that it is impossible to condemn war, oppression, or crime as evil. To kill someone or to love someone is morally equivalent. Craig doesn't do the usual argument for morality in here. He just says that if there is no ultimate morality, it is impossible to condemn bad things and, presumably, support good things. But why? I mean, I clearly can say that I condemn war, oppression, or crime. So, am I doing something that is... Impossible. Obviously, no. Greg's point here is that I can't do it objectively. As in, I can't appeal to the ultimate standard of morality. And that standard of morality comes from, in his worldview, from his God. But assuming this is all true, can he appeal to that ultimate standard himself? Can anyone? Morality is a complicated thing. Does that standard come from the Bible? Well, even if the entirety of the Bible was dedicated to all the nuances of complex moral questions, which it isn't, 
it wouldn't be enough to cover every situation. Heck, it wouldn't be enough to cover every situation where the biblical sins are a threat to the proposed ultimate fate of a person's immortal soul. At best, the Bible can offer some vague guidelines on what is and isn't good, such as the Ten Commandments. However, no attempt to turn the question like, is it okay to kill someone, into a black and white answer of no, for example, can be reconciled with both the Bible, which describes a lot of supposedly virtuous killings, beaten wars or other conflicts as punishments and vengeance, etc., and real life, where there's always going to be a case that will break the established mold. Is it okay in self-defense? But what if it's preemptive? But what counts as preemptive? What are the boundaries of justified response? Is it okay if it was partially an accident? How much partially? This is part of why we need actual judges and juries in courts, as opposed to just having a simple algorithm deciding the punishments. Pick any ethical problem, such as potentially the most famous one about the trolley, start changing the premise of it with each response, and even people with their beliefs closest to Craig's, the people who've read the same Bible he did, even in the same translation that he prefers, will eventually start giving answers different to his. This is just the inevitable fact of life. So, how does one access that ultimate standard of morality? Does it come directly from God? Obviously, nobody but the most delusional people think they have a direct hotline to God, so just asking God to give the answer to any moral or ethical question ain't gonna cut it. Even Craig, with his witness of the Holy Spirit in his heart, is not claiming that he hears clear, understandable answers from God when he prays to him. Oh sure, maybe he feels a certain way, but as in his own worldview, a fundamentally imperfect being, he cannot be sure that this feeling comes from God, and not from his own potentially misguided sense of right and wrong. Unless, that is, he dives straight into presuppositional projects and will just assert that no, -uh, he totally can because God can do that. Note that even if we were to assume this, he would therefore also be implicitly saying that everyone else who disagrees with him on any minute moral or ethical question must not be getting their answers from God, which would be very fortunate for Craig, being the only receiver of the ultimate moral standard, but would be rather unfortunate for everyone else. All in all, even if I was to accept the existence of this ultimate moral standard, reality shows that it is either completely inaccessible to humans or, if it is, indistinguishable from their own, non-ultimate moral standards. In either case, it is therefore useless to us. Now, all of this was just me basically giving the same objections to this concept of the ultimate moral standard I've heard before, which is not what I wanted to talk about to begin with, but I thought this video would be incomplete without mentioning that. But, with that out of the way, let's move to the main course. Ultimate Value Without God, nothing has any ultimate value. Not the most beautiful painting, not the shiniest diamond, not the most pleasing symphony, not even the human life. And isn't that just sad? Don't you wish that wasn't the case? That's how the argument goes, anyway. But does it make any sense? Well, let's think about it for even a moment. What is value? There are, of course, multiple definitions. We can skip the monetary ones for obvious reasons, as well as technical ones such as the relative duration of a musical note, and the ones that talk about moral values. This leaves us with either tautological definitions such as something, such as a principle or quality, intrinsically valuable or desirable, which includes the ones that just replace the word valuable with other words such as worthy, or something like this how useful or important something is. Now, think about it. How can anything or anyone be useful for an omnipotent God? He, by the very definition, can do anything that his creations can instantly, with absolutely no effort, and have the perfect result. So, from his perspective, the value of anything to an already perfect omnipotent God is clearly nil. Can something or someone be important for such a god, though? Most Christians, Craig included, would probably argue that yes, of course they can. God loves all of his children. They are important to him, 
and he also places importance on their actions. But why? For us, limited human beings, it makes sense to value friends and family, a good meal and a beautiful portrait. These things are not something that we can have after merely wishing for them, and if we lost them, we might never get them back, which is precisely why we might value them. However, what about God? Again, given his properties, he actually can get whatever he might want by merely wishing for it. And he can never lose anything, since he can just wish it back. Not that he could wish for anything, however, given that he is already perfect, which would seem to invalidate any proposition that he has a desire for something. But let's say, as I'm sure some would, that I'm wrong. Let's say that I don't understand God and how he assigns value to people. His thoughts are not my thoughts and everything. Fine. The problem doesn't disappear then, however, it just becomes the same issue we saw before when talking about the ultimate standard of morality. Of what use is the existence of ultimate value of a thing or a person to me if I not just don't know it, but I can't understand it? Well, some might say, what if the value God places upon us ties into the ultimate meaning and purpose he has for us? Glad you've asked, hypothetical people. Segue away! Ultimate meaning purpose. This is the one argument that pretty much every apologist I ever heard of, except one argument wonder such as Saiten, use every chance they get. You probably heard of it too, and it goes exactly the same as the previous one. If each individual person passes out of existence when he dies, what ultimate significance can be assigned to his life? His life might be important relative to certain other events. But if all of the events are ultimately meaningless, what can be the ultimate significance of influencing any of them? Mankind is thus no more ultimately significant than a swarm of mosquitoes, for their end is all the same. This is the horror of modern man. Because he ends in nothing, he ultimately is nothing. And wouldn't that be just sad? Wouldn't you want it to be some other way? Anyway, what is the ultimate purpose of life, the universe and everything? After all, without it, life might be important relative to certain other events. But if all of the events are ultimately meaningless, what can be the ultimate significance of influencing any of them? So, what makes this deed's effect last forever? Nothing. No, hear me out there. Think about how the Christian worldview describes the eternal existence of life after material death. A person goes to either heaven or hell. A binary choice. Sometimes, depending on specific beliefs with the addition of some in-between steps, sometimes with hell removed altogether, but nothing much more complicated than that. Was yet, the criteria for this binary choice are not even a comparison of good deeds to bad ones. No, pretty much all branches of Christianity agree that to enter heaven and, therefore, escape hell, the only thing a person needs to do is to accept the truth of Christianity. Even if it happens in the very last moment of their life, whatever it was prior to that. This is the doctrine of sola gratia, through grace alone, which has been accepted by pretty much all extant denominations of Christianity. Sure, one might argue that if a person truly accepts Christ, that would make them behave in a different way than before, becoming a better person. But even if I were to accept this, my point is, these good deeds after the conversion don't matter, just as bad deeds before it don't. So if, using Craig's example and according to his own worldview, Stalin generally accepted Jesus as his savior on his deathbed, or rather on his death floor, he would be saved and go to heaven. Same as if Mother Teresa rejected Christ with her dying breath, finally admitting that she just liked to watch the poor and sick withering away, she'd go to hell. How does that make your earthly deeds any more important than in an atheistic worldview? If anything, 
it seems to make them less important somehow. Because not only do they not matter, you shouldn't think they matter, even in terms of our finite existence. They certainly don't seem to matter to God, after all, and he's the ultimate everything. But again, it goes deeper than just that. Think about it. If God is omniscient, meaning that he knows exactly what and how will happen, that must mean that he knows in advance where any given person would end up being. This raises the question, why does this life matter at all? God knows whether you will go to heaven or hell already. He knew it since before you existed. Heck, he knew it since before the universe existed. Some Christian denominations even admit that this is the case, such as Calvinists. So maybe they will have an answer as to why does this existence, well, exist. It certainly is presumptuous for me to speak for all of them, but from my understanding there really is no known reason for it in this view. Calvin himself seemed to have described predestination as a great mystery. But is it really? Or is it just yet another consequence of inventing a fictional being and greedily applying to him all of the imaginable positive qualities in their maximally possible amount? But hey, maybe we are approaching this the wrong way. Maybe this world is necessary to prepare people for the next. Their actions might not matter in it, but they matter for them. Well, at least for the ones that do end up in heaven, anyway. That makes sense, right? Does it, though? What is there in this life that could prepare anyone for heaven, anyway? That's a justification some apologists also give for the existence of suffering, that it makes some people better, but there's no suffering in heaven, right? So what is there to be prepared for? And yet again, when we consider an omnipotent God, he could have created people with all this necessary preparation already in their heads, right up in heaven, right? Well, maybe there is no ultimate purpose for this life's deeds and experience. Maybe it's just there so that God has a justification to send people to heaven or hell. So even though he does know where will everyone end up, he allows them to experience making the choice for some reason. Maybe there's the ultimate purpose for life after death then. Again, probably not for those who end up in hell, unless they can get saved from there too, but certainly for those who end up in heaven. And what would that purpose be? But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Well, there's your ultimate, eternal, infinite, absolute purpose and meaning of life.